Nope. So, uh, I'm just going to go over the Acre 2 stuff just so we get a better idea of how our radio system that we use specifically works. Um, so, obviously, it adds in several different uh, types of radios. The primary ones that we use are the 343s, 152s, and the 117Fs. Um, so the ranges on those vary uh, depending where you're at. So for the 343s, um, obviously, if you're inside of like a populated area, uh, you're only going to be able to reach out about 400 meters, and we'll talk about why in just a little bit. Um, if you're just in like absolute perfect scenario where you're just in a flat open desert, um, you'll be able to reach out about 850 meters. Um, for the 152s, uh, if you're in the city, you can reach anywhere from 3,000 meters uh, to uh, 5,000 meters. Uh, if you're in, again, perfect ideal settings, just flat open desert, uh, anywhere from five to 7,000 meters. For the 117s, um, inside of a city, uh anywhere from 10 to 20,000 meters uh and then uh perfect ideal settings um you'll be able to hit pretty much on the horizon um which i don't know exactly the distance of measurement for that um uh, if i may but, interject, i think it's between 30 to 60k all right so there you go um but yeah basically you'll be able to uh talk to somebody that is um you know assuming you had like laser fucking precise eyesight um you'd be able to talk to anybody that you could see uh up to the up to pat up to just before past the horizon um so the acre 2 system um uses what's called half duplex radios um which means they can only transmit or receive at any given time. Um, so basically, that means if you're transmitting on a radio, you can't hear somebody talking to you. Um, so that's a big issue that we have sometimes, uh, which is called stepping on somebody's radio transmission, where basically, let's say, you know, I'm trying to talk to Skyread, and then all of a sudden, uh, somebody else comes up on net trying to talk to Skyread. Um, they're going to they're going to basically cut off my transmission. Um, or if I'm talking to Skyread and somebody's trying to talk to me, I won't be able to hear uh, one of the two, just depending on who is closer. Um, and you'll 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 learn about that, uh, yeah, in just a second. Um, so, like it says here, if there's multiple speakers on the same frequency, so basically multiple people transmitting on the same frequency. Uh, they're going to interfere with each other in such a way that you're only going to receive the strongest, so usually whoever's closest or has the least amount of interference to their transmission uh, to you if you're the one transmitting. Um, we're not going to worry about how to like change the settings and stuff like that just because it doesn't really apply to us because we use set stuff that's set up by Skyread and whoever else makes the missions. Um, so talk a little bit about terrain and object interference. Um, Acre 2 basically traces a signal path from whoever's transmitting to anybody that could potentially be receiving that transmission. Um, it talks a little bit about like the uh, frequencies that we use. Um, so. Carton is struggling right now. Um, basically talks about uh, the frequencies used on currently available radios, which is VHF to UHF 30 to 3000 megahertz. Um, it talks about how those radio waves are basically acting the same kind of way that uh, they act mostly like how light waves would act, um, more so in the sense that uh, they can be blocked or um, boosted by certain objects on the ground, uh, or by certain objects and by the ground. Um, 
However, unlike light waves, the radio waves can still penetrate things like uh, walls and things like that uh, to a certain extent, but they're going to lose power uh, and the range at which that frequency can be picked up by a receiver will be reduced. Um, so like it says here, it says that it might not affect the speaker if he's uh, in a lone building in pretty much otherwise open terrain, but it will reduce the signal strength um, and uh, the range inside of a city or a built up area is also going to be reduced. Like as you can see with the um, where it talks about the ranges for each radio up above. Um, terrain, however, will just outright block those signals. Um, some of the radio waves can bleed through via scattering and reflection. So basically, um, you might only get parts of your transmission out. Uh, but generally, radios in these um, bands or frequencies are considered line of sight as far as terrain is concerned. So technically, as long as you can look and see somebody, you'll be able to transmit to them. So pretty much trying to <clears throat> transmit out of a valley is almost going to be near damn impossible, right? Yes. So unless you can actually see that person or you have some kind of uh, antenna set up at the mm -hmm. top of one of the sides of the valleys for it to then boost that signal further out, which Acre does actually add in um, standalone radio antennas that you can place down and transmit. We've actually tested this. Okay. Uh, the only problem so is... So, essentially, it's an OE254? Not sure what that is. It's an antenna radio thing. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the only issue with those is, like, uh, so we tried doing it um, when we were more frequently doing, like, weekday patrols. So, like, actually, instead of doing patrol, like, we would still do, like, our main missions on Saturday, but I would get, like, a group of people together, or somebody would get a group of people together. Um, in like the middle of the week or a, a day of the week or after operation times or something like that. And we would go out and we would scout things out or we would look for certain things or try and achieve a, a, achieve a certain objective. Um, so one of the objectives that we attempted to perform or one of the objectives we attempted to achieve was to put down, uh, I think it was like three or four of those standalone antennas. Um, somewhere that they could pretty much we could we had it set up to where we could pretty much be at any point in the map of diala and mm -hmm. we could transmit to anywhere using the 152s okay uh, which is really good because it reduced the actual need for us to have a 117 with us um but unfortunately they're not a persistent save item so you'd have to put them down every single time and it's just very annoying to try and do that. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll talk quickly about the direct speech because it does actually matter sometimes. Um, so uh, I think it's if you hit tab and then scroll wheel, you can actually change how loud or quiet your voice is actually um, played without needing to go into like TeamSpeak and change your sliders and stuff like that. Um, and this does matter to an extent. Um, you know, like if you're like playing against like a an op four group of of players versus like AI, I think certain AI systems will actually take this into account, um, and like can actually hear you, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, at the lowest end of the scale, um, which is essentially whispering, um, your voice will be clear and audible uh, at one meter. It'll be a little bit quieter at two meters and then you'll be pretty much inaudible at 13 meters um one up from that it'll be about three meters will be loud 15 meters will be quiet and then 55 meters will be barely audible um the one that most everybody uses uh which is that middle one um 
you'll be loud at eight meters, quiet uh, at about 30 meters, and then barely audible at 100 meters. Um, the next one up from that, uh, loud at 12, quiet at 45, barely audible at 145 meters. Uh, and then the loudest where you're essentially like screaming at the top of your lungs, um, you'll be loud at 15 meters, quiet at 55 meters, and then barely audible at around 195 meters. Honestly, impressive screaming. Yeah. Um, your voice is actually... Um, it's the same thing as the radios. Um, if there's something in your way... Uh, you're you're going to be quieter, basically. So, like, if you're inside of a building and somebody's outside of a building, the person that's outside of the bu building or inside of the building will hear one or the other as muffled. And it's the same thing with vehicles. Um, the only difference with vehicles uh, um, is, like, for, like, the tanks and stuff like that, um, if they're turned in or out, you'll be able to hear them either better or worse. Um, and then the same thing with uh, firing positions in vehicles. Um, so like helicopter door gunners, you'll be a little bit quieter for them, but not as bad as if they were sitting inside of like, you know, an MRAP or a Humvee or something. Um, so we don't really use this, but if you go down to the Babel one, mm -hmm. uh, basically, um, if you wanted to have two groups of players, let's say, uh, so again, an op four, or, you know, let's just go with like how, um, Arma sets it up. So if you wanted to have an op four, a blue four, an independent and a civilian group of players, um, Acre actually introduces a feature that um you can change what language those people s what those people speak mm -hmm. um however let's say a blue four was trying to talk to uh an independent so let's just say the independents are chinese people uh we'll say blue four is obviously like americans op four is russians independent is chinese um and then we'll say the civilians are german right so each one of those people, unless they have a person to translate for them, um, it's just going to come across as incoherent babbling. Uh, the only thing with that is, like, it'll still retain the um, inflection and volume and stuff like that. Um, but you just won't be able to understand what they're saying because it comes out as though they're, like, just making incoherent sounds. Yeah. <clears throat> However you can set a player to be like an interpreter who can then switch between different languages. Um, so if your character in the game is set to understand, you know, Chinese, Russian, and German, and American, then you'll be able to hear everybody equally speaking normally. But if you don't have one of those languages set, um, then you, you won't be able to understand what they're saying, if that makes sense. Yeah cool all right so um external radios basically it just offers the ability to share radios with people so let's say um burns is an rto and he's got a 117f on him and we're like you know we're way out of the range that i could be contacting skyread with my 152 uh he can actually go into his ace interaction menu open it up and select share radio and then i can go and i can grab the 117's handset from uh burns and i can actually talk to skyread then using burns's radio okay it's pretty uh neat yeah uh and then you can obviously return it um and then uh if somebody is using your handset mm -hmm. um or your headset or whatever uh that the person that the radio belongs to won't be able to then use the radio that's currently shared. Okay. <clears throat> I'm looking through and I don't really see anything 
on this. Now, how far of a distance are you allowed to walk away from the RTO when you are using the share feature on it? It's not very far. Um, okay, I didn't know if there was it, like it's, a limit it's on relatively, it or not. It's relatively realistic in terms of like, you know, obviously the radios have like a little stretchy cord, but you know, you can't walk 100 meters away and still be able to use their radio. Okay, so it does give you some like leeway to sort of get dispersed a little bit. A little bit, but not a lot. I think like the farthest you're able to walk away might be like five meters or something like that. Okay. Five meters does sound like a good, good set for that. Yeah, that sounds pretty realistic. So it doesn't really apply to the infantry super much, but it does kind of matter a little bit. Uh, so there are intercoms on the vehicles. Uh, there's crew and passenger intercoms. Um, and you'll be able to talk without having to like try and understand, like listen over the sound of an engine. Um, so basically, crew intercom is limited to just crew members. Uh, players in the quote-unquote um, cargo positions, uh, they don't have access to it. Um, passenger intercoms can be accessed by both crew and uh passengers and it basically allows the crew to communicate with the passengers if that exists in that vehicle okay um let's see here in such a vehicle where the crew section with the passengers uh the crew and the passenger sections would be segregated in the sense they wouldn't be able to easily communicate yes uh so i think it's for stuff like um like strikers or uh like helicopters and stuff yeah. Um, there are a few different like settings for it, but we're not going to go into super crazy depth about it. If you want to learn about it more, you can come back and look. Uh, the next one that I want to talk about, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that page, is the infantry telephone. Um, it's actually a really useful thing. Um, so let's say for whatever reason, I can't get uh hayward up on the radio or whatever or i just don't feel like transmitting over the company net uh just to talk to hayward if he's parked in his tank next to us i can actually go up to his tank or pretty much any vehicle that has this feature on it and you'll be able to just ace interact with it and you'll see infantry telephone um and it essentially is and i mean this is like a real life thing too uh there is a phone in the back of most vehicles like on mm -hmm. the outside that you can open up and you can grab and you can actually talk on the crew intercom to whomever. Uh, and you can do that from outside the vehicle. So that allows you to basically like if you have infantry pulling security or something like that for a tank that uh, is watching over a road or something like that, and you guys just happen to be next to each other. Um, you can put your platoon leader or whoever next to that tank and they can grab the infantry phone and they can actually communicate to the uh, crew. So like, let's say we saw a T-80 driving up a hill or something like that and the tank overlooked it, but we have an exact location of it. Mm -hmm. I can go grab that uh, infantry phone and be like, yo, turn to bearing so-and-so or look over at your hill to your two o'clock. There's a tank there, kill it, blah, 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 blah. And that, that exists on the helicopters, gents, just to verify that for you guys. Excellent. Um, some helicopters. I don't think all of them. Some. The helicopters we use, they have them available. Yeah. Um, vehicle wrecks, this one does matter a little bit. Uh, basically, it just shows which radios are allowed to be mounted in the vehicles. Primarily, we'll be using uh, <coughs> 117Fs. Um, and uh, it just it uses the vehicle's antennas and increases the, uh, the output distance of the radio. It also will link that radio into the intercom system. Um, so for, again, for like Hayward, uh, if he doesn't have access to that rack, so basically like in the Humvees, only the driver and the, um, front passenger, I think actually have access to the rack. Uh, whereas the other passengers don't, 
Um, I could be wrong on that, just specifically talking about in-game. Um, but they actually have uh, the ability to interact with it and change channels and stuff like that, but it's also integrated into the intercom system to where they can change from crew intercom to the radio and then broadcast over the radio instead of um, broadcasting into the intercom system. Okay. Uh, signal loss, we pretty much talked about this. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the option to... Uh, To like bend your antenna upwards. So like if you look at that picture right there, uh, and you actually look at your stance indicator uh, wherever it's located at for you. Uh, I know for me it's in the upper right. Um, if you're laying down, you'll see your antenna is actually pointing straight out. So it's going to reduce your broadcast power. But you can choose to bend it upwards, and uh, while you're like laying prone, and it'll fix that problem of not being able to broadcast as far, and you'll be able to. Uh, pretty much retain the same broadcasting power while laying down. Okay. Uh, we talked about terrain loss and stuff like that. Uh, talked about interfering with other people's transmissions. Um, yeah. Team speak channel switching doesn't matter. Class names don't matter. Um, if you want to learn how to uh, use the radio, like actually like change settings on them and stuff like that a bit better, there is a uh, there's guides here to actually um, teach you how to program them. However, we have all of our radios pre-programmed to set channels to where you just flick the little uh, function switch um, up at the top and uh, you'll be good to go. Okay. Um, but if you want to learn how to do a bit more, then you can. Uh, or if you're trying to learn how to uh, actually like add radios to units, inventories, and things like that, um, you can see the, those commands, too, if you plan on building missions and stuff like that in the future. But uh, past that, I think we're done talking about the radios kind of beating a dead horse at this point. So we're going to go on to our close air support nine line brief. Um, I want as many people to learn this as possible. Not necessarily that everybody's going to be the one um, calling in. Uh, cast and stuff like mm -hmm. that but uh it's good to know um yeah in case the guy who's supposed to be calling in cast with a nine line gets taken well gets five checked pretty much um the only thing that's kind of bad about that is uh so like things like the ip slash bp so the initial point or battle position mm -hmm. um i'm sure george knows a bit more about this but uh basically for fixed wings um it, it's just talking about the starting position at which the airframe will come in for its uh run or whatever uh, and then for rotary wing uh it's the area from which they'll be hovering or or staging themselves to engage targets okay um, headings and offsets, uh, so it's given in degrees, uh, so obviously you're going to use your compass and then get a compass bearing. Um, for fixed wing aircraft, it's the, the, it's the heading that they're going to be going from the uh, initial point, uh, given again in degrees. Um, for rotary wing, it's the heading from the center of the battle position to the target. Um, and then offsets are given when needed to restrict attack aircraft uh, from maneuvering due to enemies, um, terrain, friendly fires, uh, or just to control their attack geometry. 
<clears throat> basically the offset is um, talking about uh, which side of the IP or BP um, that they can uh, maneuver to position for the attack. Uh, but the um, the aircraft can proceed pretty much straight on with that IP um, to the magnetic head and giving, um, provided it doesn't violate their offset direction uh, okay. if one is given. Uh, the distance, basically, from your set IP or your BP to the target. Um, for fixed wing, it's given um, in nautical miles, and it should be given accurate to a tenth of the nautical. Of a, it should be given um, holy fuck. A tenth of the nautical mile. So, for instance, like it says there, twelve point three nautical miles would mean twelve point thirty nautical miles. Uh, for rotary wing, uh, it's the distance is given from the center of the battle position to the target expressed in meters and should be accurate up to five meters. Um, the target's elevation, so basically where it's at above sea level, and that's okay. expressed in feet. Um, the target description, uh, it should be relatively spe specific enough for the air crew to recognize the target, uh, but it shouldn't be an overly long description, if that makes sense. So it should be accurate and concise. Like... Um, so you're not going to be like... You, so basically, like when describing it, you'd be like, you're looking for a group of five uh you know you're looking well, like a we'll squad sized element yeah squad sized element. element squad sized element or platoon sized element um next to a red truck or something like that yeah that's informative and concise i'm assuming it's the same thing for armor like you're looking for an apc you're looking for a bmp a btr series t80 series something like that right yeah. okay um, target location, so it's just uh, <clears throat> location can be given in several ways. Six digit grid coordinates, um, navigational aid fix, I don't even know what the fuck that is. Uh, visual description from a conspicuous reference points uh, are acceptable. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Sergeant, just to, if I could touch on the navigational aid fix. So basically yeah. what that means, especially with the interactive helicopter, now we actually are able to navigate to certain points on the map or, or what we call na uh, navigation aid fixes. Um, and these can be things as simple as a town name if it's marked on map. So if for whatever reason there's like a hill with a certain name, like say the hill was called Hill 76, the helicopter or the jet pile will be able to actually drop the bomb or navigate to that hill that says Hill 76 on the map. So just, just for your reference there, navigation aid fix is just literally if there's a name of something on the map, they can go ahead and drop the bomb there. They know that the target's going to be on that location. Nifty. But yeah, so that's what that means. Okay. Um, and then again, obviously, like grid coordinates uh, and then visual descriptions and stuff like that. So, you know, you could be like, it's marked with red smoke. Uh, you know, they're next to a five story red building. They're next to this, they're next to that. Um, <clears throat> your marking type. Um, so it'll be like, you know, we're using white phosphorus to my mark. We're using illumination flares. We're using IR pointers. We're using lasers. Um, if a laser designated designator is being employed, there's a four digit code that you'll see. It'll literally say code inside of like the, the um, optic that you're looking at that has that laser designator. Um, 
you'll be able to let them know that code so they know that they're going to hit the right laser designator uh, for laser guided munitions and stuff like that. When you're utilizing the lasers, um, it's important just to note that there's actually a 20 degree like safety zone. Okay, so uh, the aircraft isn't going to fly overhead of your laser. They're most likely going to be offset from your laser or in the target at a 45 degree angle. So for instance, if they're going to be attacking because your nine line says they're to come in on a certain heading, uh, so say they're going in at a 45 degree angle to the right of the target or to the right of the laser, but you have a building or something in the way of your laser, they're not going to be able to track the laser all the way to the target. So you're just going to make sure that when you're employing the laser, that you have uh, no obstruction on the right or left of your laser. Okay. Uh, and then do you know what um, the laser to target line, or is that pretty much what that that is? Uh, I'm unfamiliar with LTL. Okay, so... Neither of us know what LTL is, um, so we're just going to ignore that for now. Um, then you're also going to give the location of friendlies uh, nearest to the target. Um, the position is referenced from the target um, and expressed in cardinal or semi-cardinal directions and distance in meters. Um, and then if the friendly position is marked, identify the type of marker. Um, and then your egress is, uh, again, cardinal or semi-cardinal directions to be used when departing the target uh, and control points to use when exiting the terminal control area. Um, unlike the other lines of the briefing or your, you know, your nine line, um, the word egress is transmitted before you give the egress instructions. Um, and then remarks, uh, following information can be included if applicable. Um, you know, troops in contact or danger close. Um, you know, airspace coordination, basically their final attack heading or altitude restrictions, uh, the types of threats in the area, um, CED support and effect, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, active gun target lines, not really sure what that is, but I'm assuming that's probably. Like you know. if you have other aircraft doing um So attack. active gun target lines is your gun line. So artillery, that kind of stuff, tanks that they're firing stuff. So you just want to kind there of make go. sure that they're aware of that. Uh, the type of ordnance that you're requesting. So, you know, if you want a thousand pound JDM or, uh, you know, hellfires or something. Uh, the types of hazards that might be in the area. Uh, and then weather conditions. Uh, okay. And then the controller will assign TOT or TTT, uh, so time on target or time to target. Um, time on target is uh, done by GPS, I guess. Um, time on target is a specific time aircraft delivered ordnance will hit the target. Uh, basically, timing is based on a synchronized clock. GPS is a standard. Uh, that is used by all supporting arms agencies. So basically, everybody would look at their GPS and be like, "All right, they want the munitions to hit at you know 1720. Uh, so I got to release at this time or whatever." Uh, and then time to target uh, basically uses a countdown timer rather than a universal target or universal clock. Um, the controller states the number of minutes and seconds to elapse from the time the countdown has started to the time the aircraft delivers ordnance aircraft delivered ordinance hits the tar target the countdown is started with the word hack uh, so for example if the terminal controller were to say six plus zero zero hack the ordinance should impact the target six minutes after the hack was transmitted any other supporting arms and ground elements involved in the mission must coordinate their timing from this countdown and hack so basically anybody that's listening that needs to know when that ordinance is going to hit will also start a countdown um, immediately after hack is transmitted. Um, I'm not super familiar with this. I was hoping Skyrim would be here to break it down just a little bit further, but unfortunately he's not. Um, but if you have any questions, myself or George will do the best that we can to um, answer them.
All right, no questions. So I'm just going to um, basically reiterate a few things. Uh, generally, your IP and VPs are established prior to you calling for fires uh, or for, you know, for casts and stuff like that. So, like, you'll coordinate with them before you even leave on mission. You'll be like, hey, you know, these are the areas that we think that would be best for you to come in and potentially provide us support if we ask for it. Um, Pretty much everything else is given um, at the time of the uh, nine line briefing. Uh, the only other things that like you might be able to coordinate with them prior are like the types of marking that you'll use. So like if you know that you're going to be doing this at nighttime, then you'll know that you're either only going to be using illumination, IR pointers, or lasers. Uh, so you can go ahead and give them the code of your lays. Uh, and the types of markings that you'll be doing. Um, and then I think you can also predetermine your egress, uh, but I think that's more situationally dependent. Uh, Just to kind of like reiterate on that egress thing, the egress is just there so that they don't hit a mountain or something, or they don't overfly something they shouldn't. So, like, the egress isn't just, like, a random direction that you come up with out of your head. It's something that you should kind of, like, utilize the situational awareness and say, okay, they can't go north, so they have to egress south, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, all right, so moving on to nonline medevacs. Um, this one can be employed by pretty much anybody. Um, so we're just going to look at the card. Um, there's not really any like specifics with this, really. Um, so we're just going to go line to line like we did the last time. So line one is the location of the pickup site. You're going to transmit this in uh, grid coordinates. Um, so you'll pick, uh, you know, a nice open area for them to land, uh, and then you'll transmit that grid reference to the pilot. Um, line two will be your call sign and the frequency at which that you're on. Uh, so, you know, for me, it, it'd be Black Knight 19 frequency, you know, 72 or something. Um, your line three, number of patients by precedence. So precedence uh, is essentially just how badly do they need to be extracted so urgent is within two hours um so that's like if somebody loses a leg mm -hmm. they are urgent they need to get the fuck out of there um they need to go to surgery right away otherwise they're gonna die um if they don't get to a higher level of care uh priority it's like, you know, you might have a gunshot wound to the leg or something like that, but they can stay on the ground for a little bit longer, and it's not that big of a deal. And then routine is like, you know, you might be going out on a three-day mission, uh, and you air assaulted in or something like that, or you had a dude fall, and he uh, rolled his ankle really bad, and he's just, he's not able to really continue the mission effectively. Mm -hmm. You call in routine, uh, and you pretty much just wait for them and be like, hey, you know, we're coming in now. Um, Typically, you're only ever really going to call for urgence and priorities. Um, routines don't obviously happen in game, but uh, you know we might have a mission to evacuate civilians or something like that, and somebody's got an injury and they they are routine. They don't need surgery or anything like that. They just need to get out of there. Uh, line four, so the types of special equipment that they'll need. So whether it be uh, you know, none, so you're going to transmit uh, none. Well, you're not going to transmit that. So basically, like, when you're calling these in, um, you'll... You'll say it, the phonetic alphabet, like yes. Alpha, Bravo. Yes. Um, specifically for, like, line three, though. So, like, let's say I have five urgent patients. Um, you'll be like, five, Alpha. Right? Yeah. Um, Special equipment needed again. So, like, if they, if you're in a less than ideal position where they have to actually lower a basket to put the patient in, or some kind of hoist or something like that, where they're gonna attach to a litter, or they're gonna grab that person and lift them up out. And usually, it's used for like in the woods and stuff like that, where there's not going to be an ideal landing location close. They can actually lower 
somebody down to pick that patient up and extract them like that. Um, if you need some kind of extraction equipment, so let's let's say that uh, like a jaws yeah. of life or something like that. If you can't basically, get the person out of the vehicle, basically, um, and then ventilators. So basically, if the person can't breathe on their own. Uh, and they need somebody to breathe for them or a machine to breathe for them, the medevac helicopters can bring that equipment in. Okay. Um, now, in with Alma, are we actually going to be ever using Line 4? Or does like, um, Ace and the mods have equipment for that? Not really, to my knowledge. I don't think, Sergeant. What do you think? So, we actually do have a hoist now with the uh, new helicopter. Um... We don't have con we don't have flight medics to, to utilize those hoists yet, though. We don't. Um, but that I I haven't tested it with other people, but I think if you lower that hoist, you can then hoist another person up with it um, to retrieve that patient. But that's getting into like stuff that we have planned for the future. But okay. at some point, we hope to be able to use the full you know nine line with each of their uh, brevity codes. Um, so well, hopefully not is... line eight. <laughs> no, no, no. You do, you do give out. Uh, yeah, line eight. Um, yeah, we, do, we can. We have had civilian uh, casualties. Oh no, I'm talking about the eight. second part of line eight. Uh, oh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you've yeah, had chemical yeah. and biological. Actually, yeah, so no, we do. We do actually have that now too. Um, yeah, that's. That's 100% positive, and I'm serious, Sergeant, and everyone else in your leadership will go over, like, mop gear levels and that kind of stuff later on. Oh, no, Burns knows all about yeah, that. But he's, a, yeah. he's a Seaburn tech in the army. Oh, that's right. I <laughs> completely forgot, Cyburns. <laughs> now, do you guys do Seaburn reports in this? Out of curiosity, you know, it's off topic. Um, I've got no clue what a Seaburn report is. So you get Seaburn report 1 through 5. Like, it starts from, like, basic like hey i see white smoke over there that could be chemical munitions going off here's my grid here's the grid i'm at and then here's my azimuth and then they usually get multiple seaburn one reports together and then sort of guess where the contamination's at and each report just goes more in detail seaburn five report being down to like the 10 digit grid of what's contaminated okay gotcha that's actually interesting it's something that you guys could look forward to implementing i think that would be awesome especially since we have a cbrm mod yeah um so number of patients uh and their type um so again it's kind of like a redundancy for line three but not a redundancy um so, like, we might have a priority patient who is ambulatory, and then we'll also have a priority patient who's litter. Um, so, you know, you'll still have two priority, but then you'll also have, uh, so you'll be able to transmit line five litter, one ambulatory, one. Um, so, number of star, uh, line six is the security at the pickup site. Um, uh, I guess I guess I should iterate this. Litter bound is patients who cannot move on their own. Ambulatory is patients who obviously can are up and walking around and on their own. Um, line six is the security at the pickup site, so you don't have any enemy troops in the area, so you'll transmit uh, November. Uh, um, possible enemy troops in the area, um, they just need to approach with a little bit of caution, uh, so obviously you'll transmit Papa for line six. Um, Echo is uh, enemy troops are definitely in the area, um, but we don't, you know, like y you may not need to worry so much about them. Um, and they just are still advised to approach with caution. And then there is X, which is there is definitely enemy troops in the area, and you're going to want to have somebody to protect you while you're coming in to land and pick, a, pick up our casualties. Uh, line seven is just um, your method of marking your uh, PZ or your LZ. Um, so you'll have panels, which is the colored panels, um, pyrotechnic signals, uh, so it's like flares, um, smoke signals. Uh, I don't like this because it's telling you to transmit the color that it is, but um, yeah, you never transmit that. the color of it. You do not transmit the color. Let's uh, say because when the pilot comes in. Don't they say, 
Okay. Great. So so it will color, transmit yeah. uh, smoke signal, confirm color on approach or whatever, and you know you pop a purple smoke, and they're like uh, confirming purple smoke color, and you'll be like, "Yes, that's that's us." Because um, there's always that off chance that enemies are somehow listening, and they decide, "Oh, I'm going to pop a you know red smoke," but you know that you popped a purple smoke, so he'll be like, "Confirm red smoke," and be like, "No, that's not us. Do not land there." Right. Um, to to talk on the marking method, you're gonna always use smoke during the daytime. Uh, as far as the other uh, marking methods like chem lights and all that stuff, um, you can utilize those at nighttime. In fact, they have to be utilized at nighttime. The chem lights, those should be utilized to mark uh, obstacles uh, near the landing site. And um, if you have IR strobes or pyrotechnic signals, whatever that you can utilize, uh, those should be uh, placed in an inverted Y. Um, and basically, I can share my screen here and kind of show you what that looks like, the inverted Y, um, if you guys are interested. Um, but basically, it's a requirement for nighttime LZs just to make sure that the aircraft themselves are safe. Um, and as you can see, it's going to be a 14 by 14 area that the U-860 is going to need to land. Um, especially in a medevac case, it's going to be a medevac U-860, right? So um, you'll have a uh, right light, uh, chem light, whatever it is. You'll have one on the left, and you'll have two in front of it, uh, one spaced out 14 meters, and then the other seven meters ahead. Um, but the biggest thing to, to worry about during the nighttime is make sure your LZ is clear, at least 14 by 14, and it's on a flat surface. If it's not, that's kind of the stuff that you're going to have to implicate to the pilot or else, uh, you know, there could be issues along the line. Yeah. Um, so like he said, like, generally, you're always going to want to try and use some kind of colored smoke or something like that. But on the off chance that, you know, you don't have it or something crazy like that happens, um, you can either mark as none or, or you can transmit none or other. So, like, let's say your marking method is you have a burning vehicle next to wherever your DZ is going to be, mm -hmm. transmit other, and then um, they can, uh, you'll be able to transmit like, hey, it's going to be a black smoke column or something like that. Um, even though it kind of goes against what I just said with the uh, whole, like, you don't ever transmit smoke colors, but if you're marking with other and it's a burning vehicle or like a specific building or a specific uh, landmark or something like that, you can transmit that. Uh, and then line eight, there is technically two line eights. Um, however, let's you... say that second line eight only gets used if you um, yes. are in that environment. Yes. So only if you're in that environment. Um, so patient nationality and status, obviously, you're going to transmit if it's a US military. Uh, personnel, if it's U.S. civilian personnel, if it's non-U.S. military or civilian, or if it's an enemy prisoner of war. Uh, you omit the second part of line eight. Um, actually, that's but not... Because that second part of line be, eight is technically to be line, line nine. nine. And then if it's not in consideration yeah. and it's peacetime, then you just use like terrain features or something like that, like mountains, whatever. Yes. Um, there is also one for, I think, uh, line six uh, isn't used during peacetime. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So there is that. Um, and then obviously omit or use line eight as, or the second part of line eight as appropriate. Um, so just a quick example is Bravo five. This is Victor two request nine line medevac. Victor 2, this is Bravo 5, prepare to copy. Line 1, 1, 8, Sierra, Whiska, Whiskey, Papa, 1, 2, tree, 4, 5, 1, 7. Line 2, 2, 7, 0, 0, Bravo 5. Line tree, Alpha 1, Bravo tree. Line 4, Alpha. Line 5, Alpha 4. How copy? Over. At this point, the medevac line will repeat all given uh, and initiate movement for a medevac. So, again, if there is... What the fuck? That is a terrible example. I'm sorry. I didn't read that before. Um... 
but yeah, it's just yeah. You'll call all lines. You're not just going to call those first five. Yeah, but uh, the, I know those first five are like the ones that get the required. bird off the ground. And yeah, it's like, those... oh shit, we're taking heavy fire right now. Right. Let me you go ahead and get these first five lines. Right. You can yeah, give them the can... first five lines, and then once the bird's in the air, you can. And, and it works. It's it's just a lot easier for the pilot that way too. So even if you can transmit all nine lines or all eight lines, rather, you know, like it's it's definitely just the easiest option. They call all five in, yeah. and then. Uh, also, what's going to wind up happening is you'll notice the situation is going to change on the ground while that bird's in flight. So, yeah, you know, yeah. even if it's a five-minute flight, you know, things can still change. But yeah, so um, the first five are absolutely required to get the helo off the ground because those determine um, what equipment they have to have, what they have to be prepared for, and stuff like that. Um, and then lines six through technically nine um, are just additional information for them to know. Uh, personally, I would always transmit one through six um, at the minimum because one through six will allow them to know whether or not you have enemies in the area. Um, yeah, that way so, you can get like a um, an Apache yeah. escort spinned up. Yeah, if they need an Apache escort, if they need, you know, something of that nature. Um, does anybody have any questions on this? Uh, I have one. What's up? Um, you use line one to five for the determination for the pilots, but isn't line nine also very important when it comes to picking up uh, the casualty? Yes, so line nine is important um, if it's present. So you'll use line nine and let them know if it's present. Uh, so, you know, be like, we have some kind of chemical contamination in the area. So, you know, you need to be prepared for that so they can mask up or, or whatever they need to do. Or they need to determine whether or not are we even going to fly in there to pick them up. Okay. Um, but that's getting into a lot of, uh, like, real world specifics. So, like, if you're in a fucking chemical environment, they are not going to fly a helicopter in just to extract one person. Because the risk of contam contamination is too great. Um, yeah, but that's understand. that's more real world stuff. Like basically, real real world. If you get hit while you're in a chemical environment, you're dead anyways. So, so just an, pretty much just an armor just, uh, uh, for the calling the helo in for it itself. Uh, just the first five lines. That's the important bit. Then. Well, so I guess it's it's important to mention or to note as well is nine line medevacs are not specific to helicopters. A nine line medevac can be used to just drive a Humvee in and pick somebody up or to drive a striker in or something like that. It's just to get something on the way to you. So, you know, you'd be like, I have a nine line medevac request and you send that up to whoever you got to send it up to. And they're like, all right, we're going to get somebody on the way to you. And then they'll cut, you know, they might come back and be like, hey, we got a helicopter on the way. Hey, we got a, um, you know, we've got a uh, QRF on the way to come and help you. They're going to be there in five mics. They're coming in in Humvees, or they're coming in in Strikers, or you got a armor, you know, you got an armor escort coming in with a um, medevac vehicle to pick you guys up and get you out of there, or something like that. It's not specific to helicopters or planes or you know some dude in a fucking hand glider. I think why a lot of people this is I think why a lot of people seem to think helicopters are standard for this is because. You know, the war I mean, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Medics. Yeah, it, it's the it's, most typical thing yeah. that we encounter, and it's the fastest. Um, yeah, but I guarantee you, like, if we, if there's, like, a peer versus peer fight, when you're taking, like, thousands of casualties a day, nine times out of ten, it's probably just going to be a ground vehicle or whatever they have available. It, so the thing about it is a lot of the times, like when it comes to peer versus peer, is it's not even going to be a ground vehicle. It's And that's the direction the army's going with their medics now is they're mm -hmm. training these guys to be able to sit on casualties for like days now. They're, they're yeah. teaching them how to perform ex, uh, extended field care so that way they can actually sit on a casualty and not need to worry about, oh my god, like this dude needs like a surgical intervention. Like they're being taught how to do chest tubes. They're being taught how to do stuff like that so Pretty that way good. they can actually sit on the ground for a longer period of time 
um, because uh, the way it works, at least for real world medical, not necessarily for ACE, but real world medical is um, you have two hours that you can get a patient, like a like a absolutely fucked up patient, back to some kind of immediate higher level of medical care, and they're in that two hour window. They're um, well, not even in that two hour. It's called the golden hour, really. Yeah. And it's within an hour if you can get somebody to definitive medical care or definitive surgical treatment within an hour, their chances of survival go up exponentially uh, versus the the inverse happens uh, if you end up sitting on them for longer than that hour. Um, you know, their chances of survival exponentially go down, but that's what they're trying to fix. Is they're trying to teach uh, our, our new medics and stuff like that coming in that this is how you give definitive medical care to be able to take care of people for an extended period of time. Um, I'll be right back. I got to go to the bathroom, but that's pretty much the end of the class. If you guys want to disperse back up to the lobby, you can. Um, it's by no means is this like the official uh, radio course that you can take to get like the uh, our Rotello certification that we have. But um, it's just to give more people a better understanding of how to do other things within our group. Okay. All right.